people who have never fly fished a day in their life, never even picked up a fly rod, maybe never even fished oh, really? before. I'll hand them, Eric and I will we'll hand them a fly rod. We'll give them some oh, instructions. Nice. And before you know it, they're, they're hooked on yeah. fly fishing, not just fishing, but they're hooked on yeah. fly fishing. Welcome to the Discovering the Last Frontier podcast. I'm your host, Lucas. I'm really excited for this week's guests. They're going to be covering a topic that's near and dear to my heart. This is the type of experience that got me hooked on coming to Alaska over 20 years ago. And it really set the wheels in motion for me to move to Alaska five years ago. I can't wait to dive into this episode. Before we do, though, I just want to go back and remind everyone that episode five featured Otto Kilcher. Um, Otto spun some really good yarns. He kept us in stitches. So if you like all things homesteading, off the grid living, please go back to episode five and check out our time with Otto. So joining me today are a couple of fellas who are living the dream, drifting down a world-class river all summer and hitting the slopes all winter. Eric and Krister are here today to cover drifting down the Kenai River out of Cooper Landing on the Kenai Peninsula. These two are experienced fishermen and guides who offer a wealth of knowledge for anyone who's considering a trip to Alaska to do some fishing. Frankly, they're going to be talking about a must-do experience for any fisherman or fisherwoman making the trip to Alaska. Please welcome Eric and Krister Rawls. Welcome, guys. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? How you doing, Lucas? Thanks yeah, for yeah, us. I'm doing good. Uh, I'm I'm actually down in Hawaii right now, but uh, enjoying life. I just left Alaska. I'll be be out for a month, and then I'll I'll head back up there. So it's chilly. You're missing a yeah, good time. It was getting cold as I was uh, heading out of town. So I kind of kind of figured it was a good time to make an escape. Yeah, yeah I'm over here. I'm over here in oh, Utah, really? so a little cold here here this winter as well. So you're you're escaping the the, the chilliness. Oh, wow. Cool. Well, very good. So first of all, I know that you guys are both from the Midwest. So I guess I'd like to get a little background on how the heck did you end up in Cooper Landing and and ultimately end up as you know you know having a couple of the best jobs in the world. Like, what's the backstory here? Yeah, so I kind of got uh, the opportunity. I was I was driving truck in Minnesota. Eric, first of all, Eric and I have been fishing our whole lives in Minnesota. I mean, uh, the Midwest is great. The great uh, land of ten thousand lakes. We got rivers. We got trout. We got all the species of fish. So we've been fishing our whole lives. Uh, fly fishing, regular fishing, ice fishing, all of that. Um, but. Eric and I were both working back in Minnesota. I was driving semi trucks. Eric was working at a goat farm and, um, I was doing road construction. So I got laid off in the winter and I traveled out to Utah to visit some friends out here, uh, for about a month to do some snowboarding. And my friend Shane, who I was rooming with out here, he knew an owner of a guide service up there, Alaska river mm. adventures. And, and I got into town and he said, yo man, do you, do you like your truck driving job? You should quit that job. Cause I got a, I got a guiding gig for you. And I'm like, ah, I'm not doing that. There's no way I, you know, I spent too much time learning how to drive this truck. You know, I got a good Minnesota and my buddy Shane just kept <laughs> hounding on me for like two weeks straight. And he goes, man, you should quit that truck driving job. And what he said was, you know, you can always get another truck driving job. So that was kind of, that was kind of where I really started, you know, thinking about actually doing this. Um, I met the owner of Alaska river adventures, Tyler, uh, did like a 10 minute interview with him. And he's like, Hey man, I, you know, I can tell that you're a fishy <laughs> guy and you got the job if you want it. And I said, you know, I would love to do it, but the only way I'm going is if my older brother Eric can uh -huh. come too. Um, and so Ty had to pull some strings. He didn't really have a guide position for Eric. He only had one guide position yep. to start with. And Eric was going to just do, um, uh -huh. scenic tours to start just because he wanted to be in Alaska and he was going to be able to fish himself a lot more uh -huh. than I was because I was going to be guiding. Um, and so I, I called Eric and I said, Hey man, there's a spot here. You're like, what, what should we do? And he's like, let's do it. Let's <laughs> quit our jobs. Let's go put some money into our suburban that had 280,000 miles on it, pack that thing up. Um, and we did about a 16 day road trip. We, we, uh, we drove from Minnesota up to Alaska, stopped in Montana for a couple right of on. days to do right some on. fishing, um, and cruised up in, it was in May. Okay. May. Yeah. It would have been May. And actually Eric and I had never rode a drift boat before, never been guides before. 
and we just figured we had what it took. We got up to Cooper Landing about a month before the season opened, got in those drift boats, rode every day a couple times yeah. a day on the on the stretch, and uh, the water was clear, so you could see a lot of the fish, um, could see where they were holding and everything like that, and just learn that oh. stretch. Um, yeah, so we we kind of just sink yeah, or swim yeah. right you get you go up there and uh we we just devoted our all of our time to the Kenai wow, River. wow how cool and what a what an awesome trip up i've done i've done the drive from minnesota up to um you know Kenai peninsula probably four or five times now but i tell you what you get in that northern british columbia yukon eastern oh. Alaska. i mean the wildlife you it's see insane. the scenery it's like there's nothing like it it's so awesome nothing yeah. Yeah. The elk, the elk can was yes. something special, man. And for Eric and I, you know, a couple of brothers just to, you know, drive all the way up there with on a whim like this. I mean, it was, it was something special for yeah, us. Yeah. Sure. So cool. Well, that's a great story of how you ended up there. You never know what kind of opportunities you're going to have unless you actually take them when they present themselves, you know, like it was one of those things where you just don't, you don't let that kind of thing pass you by. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think yeah, you should. Exactly. You know, my story, first trip to Alaska, it was uh, it was a little over 20 years ago, um, and I actually just went up there to fish uh, on the Kenai River, of all places, right? So um, flew up there with my dad, my uncle, and my cousin, and, and we spent a week there. The first day on the Kenai River, I hooked into a uh, king salmon that was just over 60 pounds. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, like Thai E, you know, you know what I mean? And it was literally like that 18 year old that goes into the casino, like for the first time and like hits a jackpot, you're ruined for life, right? It's, it's a blessing, but it's an absolute curse. You're like ruined, right? So then after that, I just wanted to keep going back, keep going back. And finally, when I had the opportunity to move up here five years ago, I jumped on it and I took it and uh, we bought land, we built and we made the move. Today's sponsor, Bear Cove Retreat. Let Bear Cove Retreat be your guide as you embark upon your dream Alaskan coastal adventure. Their off-the-grid, all-inclusive retreat is the perfect option for folks seeking a journey with unique experiences in a serene setting. Visit www.bearcoveretreat.com for more details. So when, when you guys think of all the clients and, and friends and others that you've taken down the river on a drift like this, have you had any clients where you look back and you say, oh, yeah, I've had those that had your exact experience, right? They get on the river, they have this, this awesome catch or this awesome experience, and they're hooked for life. Like, Can you recall some of those circumstances and maybe tell us a little more about them? It's funny because it seems like it, usually the people who – aren't as fishy that get lucky a lot of times at least on my boat where it's like they might not even have that much interest in fishing they might because i mean a lot of what we do is a is a guided tour down the river too it's absolutely gorgeous and the fishing's kind of a bonus in Mm -hmm. my opinion like being out there and just experiencing the outdoors is awesome and we get a lot of clientele that you know they're not all super fishy people all the time and those are usually the ones who end up getting the biggest fish on my boat and they're always just blown away by why haven't i been doing this my whole life or whatever the case may be it's like and you you can tell that it really has a big impact on them when they have success and they weren't really having any expectations which is probably the best client you know when when somebody who isn't expecting the world and in my opinion, there, you know, it is kind of beginner's luck and you're like, yeah, man, you might've ruined the rest of your fishing career, but they kind of deserve it too, because they're not coming into it with these big heads and, you know, wanting, wanting to catch a giant trophy. They're just out there to enjoy, enjoy their time. So, um, yeah, I, uh, had a family that are Minnesotans as well, actually last year and their kid is fully hooked on fly fishing now um he was i wish we had this when i was in high school but they're they have a bass team back home and so he's a bass fisherman and regular conventional gear and everything like that and ended up getting on my boat and catching quite a few fish because he was you know had some experience with a spin gear and younger kid but i mean he's hooked for life now and they're coming back they're key clients and that just 
feels awesome, you know, to cool. share share that experience and give them a, a new tool, even if they're already fisher people. Like he he's got a he's got a new tool yeah. to use in the fishing world now, being a fly rod. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I feel like the Kenai any day could be your day. <laughs> you know, I mean there's no dams on it. Um, it's all natural fishery. These fish migrate a lot. They move back and forth. Um, there's nothing stopping them. So, you know, Eric and I were up in Cooper Landing and we're at the very headwaters of the Kenai and the fish from the lower section of the river can come all the way up there at any given time, you know? So you get people that, you know, have never fished before a day in their life and they come out and you give them some instructions. And as long as they set that hook the way you told them to and fight the fish the way they you tell them to i mean they could land a fish of a lifetime definitely. wow and how far is it that those fish are swimming up river let's say the ones that are migrating you know coming in from uh the cook inlet um you know i just think of that current and it is ripping they have to do a ton of work to get up to the point where you are is it is it over 20 miles 82 yeah. to the bridge at cooper landing so the bridge in cooper landing is the headwaters of yep. the kenai um North of the bridge is Kenai Lake and south of the bridge is Kenai River. So it's kind of lake like at the very top of the river yep. section. But to that bridge from the ocean is 82 miles. Unbelievable. So the fish are going a long, long way. And the trout are, a lot of them are resident fish. There's migratory fish that live in the ocean as well. Um, but those fish are migrating throughout the system during the season kind of dictated by the spawning patterns of the salmon and where their food sources are. So um a lot of times they're they're moving around too. The lower the middle river is kind of known for the bigger trout potentially, but there that doesn't mean that there's not giants up top too because there are. Um every year, you know, somebody's catching a 30 plus inch rainbow trout oh. up there. Um so there's there's for sure trophies all the way through the river system. And like Christer said, it's just kind of luck of the draw. I mean, uh, there's all different size classes and you don't know what you're going to get until you set that hook. To me, the special thing is that it's all natural. And Lucas, you mentioned, you know, how strong that current is. I mean, that river is deep and it's fast and it's moving fast. These fish are strong. They're healthy. They have the same genetics that they've always mm -hmm. had. You know, they're not any stalkers or anything like that. I mean, these fish are strong. So yeah, it's awesome. a good time. Awesome. So we're, you're kind of give, giving an overview of the river in general. Um, for folks that are less familiar with the river, can you kind of walk through what species you're targeting as you go through the season, June through September, and just kind of walk us through a typical year and what, you, what you're going to be targeting at various points? So, yeah, the season starts off and kind of varies year to year as to whether the sockeye will be around as high as we are in the system. Okay. Um, there, will be, there will be sockeye in the Kenai River June 11th when the season opens, and that's when the season opens for everything. Um, but they aren't always all the way up the 82 miles of river yet to the headwaters. Last year they were. We were fishing for sockeye, red salmon, right away, right out on opener. Early. On yep. opener. There, there's fish everywhere. And it was phenomenal. Um, but the first couple weeks of the season can be more trout bait orientated just because there aren't a ton of salmon potentially as high up okay. as we are. Um okay. The river is broken into three different sections, the upper river, which is the headwaters, and that's kind of our home ground, the middle river, which is more of a slower section of river, not as gradient, not as steep of a gradient, not in the mountains anymore, Soldatna, right in that area, in between Sterling and Soldatna, Alaska, and then the mouth, the lower river, is in the town of Kenai itself. Okay. Um, so the, the different sections of the river kind of dictate a little bit what you're fishing for. Um, it's a lot more salmon orientated lower in the river. And then as you get higher in the river, there's less, less salmon relatively because they've dispersed into different tributaries that flow in, um, 2.4 million sockeye ran into the Kenai last year though. So it's not like there's a lack of fish by any means, but, um, yeah, yeah. so we start out with trout, uh, mostly. And we'll get a few salmon trips. And then as um, June 
comes to an end, those salmon are in and force. And we're we're definitely splitting our days. You know, it's probably 50 50 between trout trips and salmon trips by the end of June. Yep. And there's there's two runs of these sockeye. Um, the first run comes in in June. Second run, we start seeing those, you know, beginning to middle of mm-hmm. July. Um, after that second run comes in, you're still getting some chrome fish. Um, but then the trout start, you know, feeding on, you know, they're starting to get ready for those salmon to mm-hmm. drop eggs. Um, once those salmon start to spawn, those sockeye, the trout fishing catch and release for trout and Dolly Varden. Dolly Varden's a member mm-hmm. of the Char family. Um, that fishing really picks up once once those salmon are in are in are spawning the the trout just go nuts for the eggs and all the flesh in the river mm. as well um so we're we're kind of doing catch and release then once once that second run of salmon comes in um they start to change colors they start to mutate a little bit and their meat's not as good um we'll we'll just be doing catch and release for rainbow trout dolly varden through july uh into august and then we start to see the silvers come in um end of August into okay. September. Okay. And and uh how is the silver fishing up there? I've I've never fished silver that far up the river. Of course I have down by Kenai, but that far up the river you you actually get silvers up there, huh? Yeah, we get chrome oh, really? fish up there. Yeah. Some of those some of those silvers, they just shoot up that eighty miles super fast. Twenty miles a day, I think, is what oh. they've been recruiting. I mean, on a good day, so they can be up there in four days from the ocean okay. pretty easily. And they're swimming across a giant lake, too, to get there. Ski right. Lake in the middle. Kind of lake, yeah. yeah. But the silver yep. fishing, I mean, it's it's tough. It's We're, we're kind of in the most technical section of the river, uh, in my opinion. All the fish that come up that are migrating had to come through a gauntlet to get there. Um, so they've seen pretty much everything you can throw at them. They, they've, they've seen the kitchen sink come at them. I mean, um, there's, you know, you, you've seen, people have probably seen videos of people catching salmon on top waters and stuff like that. And being able to throw like a popper on a fly rod or something and have these silver salmon chase that stuff down. By the time they get up to us, that's not as much the case. Um, they're, they're quite a bit more finicky, um, and they definitely take a little bit of work to get to bite. They're usually when you come out on a pot of silvers, if it's the first time they've seen anything that day, you'll be able to get one in the first cast or two. But once that school of fish has been disturbed, um, it can take hours before a fish will mm. bite again. So they're it, it, it's challenging, but it's it's one of my favorite times, honestly. Like the silvers are kind of my favorite and- to target. Here's the other thing, Lucas, where we're at up on the upper, upper, upper mm-hmm. part of the Kenai, no motors oh, allowed. Right. So we're just running drift boats and it's really pristine up there. There's no motors. It's not as crowded. Um, you get a little bit more of that, you know, nature, you know, feel. It's a little bit more relaxing on the upper, upper, I would say, than down on the middle. The middle's more. You know, we're going to run and gun with motors and go as fast as we can. And, you know, it's just kind of crazy. But, um, you know, that upper section that we're fishing, phenomenal fishing, but you also get a little bit more peace and quiet. Yeah, there. cool. How how big do the silvers get? What What's a typical range that you see uh, up in your part of the river? Eight to 12. Eight to 12. Regular. You could get a, you could get a 15 pounder easy. Um, there's some big fish up wow. there for sure. Yeah, I got one. I got a really good one the first year, probably put in thirteen or fourteen. Okay. Um, and I mean, they get even bigger than that, you know. So I haven't seen anything bigger personally, mm-hmm. but yeah, right around that, I would say average is somewhere to yeah. nine okay. pounds, somewhere in there. They're they're good size fish. Yeah, I was kind of curious about that because you know when I think I I target silvers quite a bit um, between the Homer area and down um, just off of Kodiak. I've got some property there. And so I'm fishing silvers quite a bit. Um, my biggest is 14, which, you know, I was happy as heck with that. You know what I mean? Um, and I, di- I didn't know if they, they leaned out. You know, you're talking about this 82-mile gauntlet. And so I wasn't sure if they leaned out over that time or if they still held a lot of their bulk. No, they have big, big fat fish. fish. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's really... I, I don't 
I don't know as much about the silver migration as I do the sockeye because it's kind of our bread and butter up there. But yeah, those fish are pound for pound. They're definitely some of the strongest fighters. I mean, and the silvers remind me a lot of smallmouth bass. I don't know why, but they, and I just I really really like targeting them. They're kind of finicky, but when it's on, it's on, and they're biting good, and they fight hard, and they jump and, and it, they're all over the yeah. place. And you'll so, you'll get one that's fresh. You'll get ones that's fresh, and he'll just yeah. There, you know, I mean, he goes if he gets out into that fast current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, man, just to get, I like getting schooled by fish every <laughs> once in a while. You know, because it's like it's like man, I I did everything I could to catch that thing, and there was nothing yeah. I could do. Like that thing's just I. He's gonna live to fight I, another day. You know what you're saying is so true. So when I think about when I'm fishing silvers, let's say out in the ocean. I've got a swivel between my hook and the spoon. I literally have a swivel right there because they twist and turn and jump so much that if you don't have that swivel once in a while, they can kind of twist that hook relative to the spoon and twist right. it right out of their mouth. So I got a swivel there just to try to allow that freedom of movement. You know what I mean? Because they're so damn just yeah. tenacious when they're, when they're on. Yeah, right. they're, they're a blast. I love catching them. Yeah, and, you know, on up on the upper upper it's it's day to day you'll pull into a backwater one day and there'll be 30 fish in there and you'll you'll catch your limit of you know two fish person and then you'll come back the next day and that group has yeah. moved on i mean they're constantly moving up river so it is a day-to-day -day thing you know i mean our clients that you know a lot of the time there's a lot of expectations they're like are we going to get our limit today it's like i have no idea what the yeah. salmon are doing today you know yeah um some days you go out and you don't think it's going to be that good and yep. it's phenomenal, you know? So it, it's literally a day to day with these fish migrating, um, up this you know, system. I've, I've, I've fished yeah. more the, the middle and the lower, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Like with sockeye, you know, there's days when I've been on shore and going, you know, just trying to catch fish, right. And just nothing's happening. And all of a sudden this wave comes through and you've got your limit of six in like 15 minutes, you know what I mean? And you're looking around and everybody right. is pulling fish in. And as soon as, as quick as it starts, it stops. And then you're just waiting for the right. next school, you know, to kind of come ripping through. But that's, I mean, that's right. fishing, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real experience with the silvers. I mean, they're, it, I don't know the numbers because they don't actually do a count on the silvers on the Kenai. So it, it, I know it's less than the sockeye though. So like, you, I, and we can just see it up there, you know, like there's just less of yeah. them around. Um, but yeah, it's just crazy because they're holding a lot of times where we're targeting them on the upper is in these slow backwater sections where they're resting. Yep. Um, and like Christopher was saying, you'll go into a slough or a backwater off the edge of the river and there'll be no fish in there. And you could maybe pull over and have lunch and have that whole backwater fill up with salmon while you're eating right, lunch. Right. And you know, just like they're there and they're migrating and they're always moving and it's just luck of the draw if you're going to find them. I mean, we know some sweet spots where they like to hang out and can definitely have a, a decent opportunity at seeing some fish, but it's never a guarantee with the silvers yeah, ever. Yeah. Well, very cool. Thanks for kind of covering the season, what folks could expect while they're out there fishing. Um, so if I was a newbie, let's say I'm someone who, well, yeah, I've cast it off the dock and a little bit of that. Um, would I be able to handle uh, a, a drift down the river with you guys? Do you offer any instruction and give people some help that haven't done anything like this before? One of our sponsors today is Story Film Productions. Would you like some assistance filming a podcast or starting a YouTube channel? Maybe you're looking for someone to help create a commercial for your business, product, or service. Story Film Productions can help. This Minnesota-based company can help you tell your story in an impactful way through the art of videography. Visit www.storyfilmproductions.com to set up a free consultation to discuss your video or editing needs. So if I was a newbie, let's say I'm someone who, well, yeah, I've cast it off the dock and a little bit of that. Um, would I be able to handle uh, a, a drift down the river with you guys? Do you offer any instruction and give people some help that haven't done anything like this before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lots of instruction. We get lots of beginner clients. Um, and the nice thing about the drift boat is your cast doesn't have to be mm -hmm. far. 
which is the intimidating part with a fly rod um, for a lot of people. And we also offer spinning gear if the fly fishing is not being successful. I mean, both of us have spin gear on our boat. Both of us would kind of prefer to fly fish, and we think it's a more fun way to fish the upper mm-hmm. river overall. Um, and I kind of say- depends on the day, mm-hmm. I would say. You know, some days, some days spin fishing is really good. We we pull plugs uh, out of the bow of the boat, um, and if it if it's fishing really good, and I got a family of four on my boat with a couple of young kids. Um, and we're only doing a half day and I know if I put those plugs in, we're going to have a good day. I'll just fish mm-hmm. the plugs, you know, if, if, if they, a lot of people will be a little timid about the fly yeah. fishing and I'll try, if, if I know the fly fishing is good and they've never fly fished before, but I know that I, if they listen to me, we're going to catch fish. Um, we'll, we'll fly fish our clients mm. for sure. For people who have never fly fished a day in their life, never even picked up a fly rod, maybe never even fished oh, really? before. I'll hand them, Eric and I will, we'll hand them a fly rod. We'll give them some oh, instructions. Nice. And before you know it, they're, they're hooked on yeah. fly fishing, not just fishing, but they're hooked on yeah. fly fishing. So, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an awesome opportunity. And the boat just makes everything way more feasible for inexperienced anglers. Like I'm able to put the boat pretty much right on top of these fish. And the Kenai is a glacial river. So it's got a lot of, uh, fine sediment in it, which, kind of hides our boat the water's fairly clear depending on what we have going on for precipitation and what the glacier's doing it's it's a really wild ecosystem but a lot of times the visibility is a little bit murky just a A little little bit bit. just enough to hide the boat so that not spooking fish by going directly over the top of them you can catch a fish literally with your line right next to our boat so the casting with the fly rod is, it, it's very simple. It's just a pitch. Yeah. You're just lifting the rod tip and flipping it into the water. And then I try to match the speed of your line with the rowing of the boat. Oh, so, um, so it's kind yeah, of running. And we're using a bobber. Oh, it's kind of running parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We're using a bobber. Yep. So a strike yep, indicator. Okay. Very cool. So, so yeah. And so ahead. a lot of the time, you know, my clients, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them we're fly fishing today. And they're like, Oh no, <laughs> I, I can't fly fish. And I'll be like, well, have you ever bobber fish before? And they'd be like, Oh yeah, I bobber fish all the time. I'm like, okay, well that's what we're doing today. Just with okay. a fly rod. And they're like, really? You know? And so it's, it's not that, you know, over the back of the head, you know, you know, river runs through <laughs> yeah. a cast, you know, you're not going to be launching a 50 yard cast out there. It's more of a roll cast more of a lob like eric said you're literally just picking that line up throwing it out about five ten feet away from the boat and then we are like eric said matching the same speed as the current with our flies or our eggs because that's what the fish are seeing naturally they're seeing this bait come down the river at the exact same speed as the current so we match that speed and then as soon as that strike indicator that bobber goes down you just rod to god lift your rod tip up in the air and you're hooked up you know and like Eric was saying earlier, you know, a lot of the inexperienced people outfish the experienced people because the inexperienced people don't have any bad habits. And so when we teach people that have never fished before, you know, the wives on the boat outfish the husbands all the time out there because the husband doesn't listen like the wife yeah. does, you know. And uh, so the inexperience is actually... It, it can be better, honestly, than someone who has a lot of experience because they listen to our direction you know i i have the exact same experience out on the big water when you're halibut fishing uh, you know i get these folks that are you know know how to fish done a lot of fishing and they're setting the hook and you're like dude it's a circle of just real you gotta stop setting the hook. right you know but it's those right. bad habits if you will that uh that make it a challenge so i see the same thing sometimes the less experienced fisher people are by far out fishing everyone else which is which is kind of cool yeah. kind of right. cool I got to clear up one thing that you said, though. You, you talked about the river being yeah. murky, and and I would classify it as like the most beautiful murky river I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's, right, it's pretty right. cool. No, that's that's not a yeah, that's not a good way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Murky. No, that's not a good way to describe it. Um, what Eric was talking about is that, that sediment that comes into the river off the glacier. Um, it's fine sediment. So light reflects yeah. off of it. And it's really a turquoise, mm-hmm. beautiful color. I mean, that's what the Kenai is yeah. famous for is yeah. its color. Um, 
it just doesn't look like any other river you've ever seen before. It's it's kind of this turquoise, kind of cloudy, pretty yeah. blue. You know what's what's interesting is um, where I live is back in Bear Cove and Ketchumac Bay, and behind us is the Dixon Glacier, and so that feeds down into Bear Cove. We have the exact same water color in Bear Cove as the Kenai River. You know the same sediments and everything. It's nice. It's really sweet. Yeah. You know, and you're taking pictures and stuff. And you're, it's like it's tropical, you know what I mean? It almost looks like yeah, a yeah. tropical climate. A, lo- a, lo- a lot of the rivers in Alaska, you know, when Eric and I were driving um, down to Cooper Landing, we're seeing all these really mm-hmm. gray rivers, you know, and those are all glacial runoff rivers as well. The difference that the Kenai has is it has Kenai Lake. It acts as this big mm-hmm. coffee filter. It filters out a lot of that sediment, and that's just left with those fine yeah. dust particles in the water that gives it that turquoise color. Um, so without that lake, it would probably be a lot more yeah, gray. Yeah, right on. So I've, I've done some boating up the inside passage in the lake. And the closer you get to the glacier, um, the, the grayer, almost like chocolate melt color it gets. But as you get further away, yeah, as you get further away, it starts to develop this brilliant turquoise color. Uh, so it's really cool what you're saying. And, and you're exactly right. Too much sediment and it looks like, you know, almost murky, right? Like this grayish brown. Right. And when you get that right amount of sediment in there, it's just like, oh my gosh. Like people wonder what kind of filter is that? Like that is it. That's what it looks like, you know? Yeah. Live and in person. Yeah. Picked up right. Like that's the funny part. I shoot a lot of photos and you, if the camera doesn't even pick up right. the blue the right, necessarily the right way. Like I, I, I always knew this being a photographer, but photos never mm-hmm. do it justice. And like, well, anything you see from Alaska, it's 10 times cooler than what a photo yeah. or a video yeah. does. It, it's, it's so much better in person than uh, living vicariously through social media or something <laughs> like that. I mean, it, it's, right. it's not describable. I mean, that, that blue quality of that river, and it, it, it fluctuates. I mean, right now, with being in the middle of winter, that river is really low. And it's pretty yeah. clear. It's it doesn't have that blue tint, and that's because the glacier isn't melting right now. So it's all based on that glacial uh, mm-hmm. impact, and that was probably the hardest thing to get used to for us coming from the Midwest, not knowing how a glacier would impact a mm-hmm. fishery. I mean, and it, it's it's got its it's got its uh, difficulties to manage yeah. for sure. Uh, there's times where that river is the hardest place i've ever fished in my life just because of the way the glacier is acting i mean we can get discharges of really cold water which shut the fish down quite a bit uh fish are cold flooded and they they their whole metabolism is pretty much based on water temperature so when we get uh we can get a 10 degree water temperature fluctuation overnight and for no reason and the speculation from my end is, you know, if it rained up on the glacier and all that cold water was running down that cold glacier into the lake and it ended up in there and then the lake, uh, the dynamics of cold water in a lake are crazy. The lake kind of turns yep. over. So the water is the water is shifting in the lake. Usually it's warm water on top, cold water on bottom. But if that flips, all that cold water comes down into the river at once and it just overnight we can have a 10 degree to water temperature swing and that'll shut the fishing down for two days i mean we'll, we usually will manage to pick one or two up no matter what uh very few days i've, I've been skunked out there it does mm-hmm. happen but um, it is fishing. It's, it's fishing, it is yes it's definitely fishing. yeah so it's it's crazy to try and get really in tune with the um, ecosystem, the, just the difference of having a glacier that's really the backbone of that entire ecosystem. And that's what's running the, the river. I mean, we can't control anything. And like Christopher was saying, there's no dam. So there's no way to mitigate that consistency of fluctuation when the glacier does whatever it wants. And when it does it, you can't do anything about it. So it's, yeah, you're at the mercy of that big block of ice. That's back to that day-to-day yeah. basis on yeah. how fishing is, you know what I mean? But that's kind of the fun thing for Eric and I. Um, you know, this river changes so much on a day-to-day that it keeps you on your toes. Um, and, you know, we'll get done with a guided trip and we'll come back, you know, I'll take one boat, he'll take another boat. 
we'll get back and we'll bounce ideas mm-hmm. off of each other. Like, how was your day? What did you catch them on? Where did you fish? You know, and, uh, you know, we work really good together in that, in that aspect. Um, we both tie all of our own flies oh, too. Nice. So, um, and Eric kind of took the reins on that. I would say he's taught me a lot on mm-hmm. time flies. Um, but when we get done with a day of fishing, maybe he did better than I did on some fly that he tied. He'll show me the pattern. We'll just sit down on the bench, tie a bunch mm-hmm. of flies cook dinner, go to bed and rinse and repeat rack on the water the oh, next day. Cool. Oh, that is, it, it sounds great. So when you're, you guys are, are starting to touch this, but um, you know, fishing is just part of it, right? There's also beautiful scenery. There's other wildlife, et cetera. Can you maybe paint a picture for the viewers and the listeners um, of what they might expect to see for scenery, what you see for wildlife. And I know it doesn't happen every trip, but what are some of the potentials that people could experience while they're out there? There's always eagles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one thing we do guarantee. <laughs> nice. There's pretty much no day. I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think I've gone a single day without seeing at least one eagle. So usually people are pretty excited about that. Coming from the Midwest, we, you know, we have a lot of eagles in the Midwest, but a lot of places in the country don't get to see uh, America, America's birds. So they're they're pretty excited to see that. And we get to see some cool interaction mm-hmm. with them. They're, they're, they're fishing too. They're hunting too. Yeah time so um they're kind of the ever present uh there's lots of birds so if you're if you're a bird person there's all kinds of birds we got sea ducks and uh, kingfishers and different types of gulls and all that kind of stuff that that's that's definitely a day-to-day and you're guaranteed to see some kind of bird out there for sure you know and i would say the eagles are probably one of the best parts because they're so consistent. They're there every day. Some days you might see 15 mm-hmm. or 20 on a float. I had a uh, Eagle try and grab a client's trout out of the water that was hooked up. Wow. You know, I mean, he's fighting this nice trout, this nice rainbow last year and the things jumping out of the water. And then an Eagle swoops down and tries to grab it. You know, um, the Eagles will sit really low on branches and we were able to row right mm-hmm. underneath them. I mean, they're five, 10 feet from wow. you sometimes. Um, so you really get a good eye on Eagles pretty much every okay. float. Um, and then, you know, uh, bears and moose, we see a decent amount of bears. I mean, it's not an everyday yep. thing. Um, but you know, you'll be rowing down the river and you'll see something swimming across. Sometimes it's a moose, sometimes okay. it's a bear. We keep our distance, you know, we don't want to disturb mm-hmm. these animals, but you can row pretty close to them, you know, and, um, sometimes they put on Are a these show brown bear you. then that you're seeing. Yeah, oh, brown bear. Uh, black bear. And oh, black. Oh. Yep, yep. yep. Okay. Also black bear too. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, very cool. Yep. So um there's a couple otters in the in the river as well. Every once in a while. I, I only saw them once last year. They're kind of few and far between and um there's links around. So there's all different kinds of wildlife. And then we're floating through a pristine ecosystem for the most part. I mean the one reason that the Kenai is so popular is because it is right on the road system in Alaska and there aren't a lot of roads. So it's, it, it definitely, it run the river runs pretty close to the road because it's in a valley and the only place to build the road was right next to the river. So there are sections where the river bumps right up against the road and we'll be dealing with a little bit of traffic. But other than that, um, the first mile and a half has some resorts on it. The rest of it, on our upper section, there's no houses, no buildings. Um, once you get down uh, a little bit lower in the upper section, there's a section called the canyon, and it is through a wildlife refuge, and it breaks away from the road, and you're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you're in as remote as you can get without flying yeah, yeah. Um, or without taking a boat a really long way. And it's 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 not a hundred percent safe. Nothing ever is. And the river, yeah. you know, the river's got its challenges, but if you want to get into the back country of Alaska without taking a massive, uh, a risk, a, a mitigated risk or without having a bunch of knowledge, it's a great place to do it because you're, you're miles from the road by the time you get to the end of this, the so, Canyon, um, and it dumps ski lake. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the outflow goes into ski lake lake. And we have to drive our boats across Elac Lake to get to the landings. 
Ski Lag is yeah. beautiful. You can barely even see across it. It's such a big lake, you know, no yeah. houses, no roads. You're in the oh, middle cool. of nowhere. Um, and that whole section, you know, the upper, upper section that Eric and I float from Cooper Landing all the way down to Ski Lag Lake, it's all very, very beautiful. I mean, it's just the banks, there's no erosion. Yeah. There's no, you know, it's just pristine. There's, there's nothing that's really messed with it over time, you know? So, you know, oh, you guys are, you guys gorgeous. are talking about the scenery and the wildlife. Like, is the only way to access with you guys through fishing or do you offer trips where you just do a float and you, you just kind of take it all in? Is that an option? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have a, we have a raft, um, section of our company. Oh. So, um, we do, well, it's, it's not white water per se. There are, there are two couple mm-hmm. bits. Yeah, it depends on okay. the section. There, there's there's some rapids that can get up to right at the class three, so just just about to where you're starting to get to actual mm-hmm. white water. Uh, class ones and twos are pretty easy. I mean, it's still rapids, but it's nothing to be very concerned about. And then if you get down into the canyon at the right time, there can be some class threes that they're they're pretty big rapids. Um, so you that's the other nice thing about the float. I mean, um. I, I take my drift boat through the rapids and when we got little kids who might not be doing so good with the fishing or a tor- mm-hmm. shorter attention span, they get a little bit of something out of the, out of the float as well. And then, yeah, the rafts that we run, I think they hold up to 12. So, um, our drift boats, we can only take four passengers. Yep. So it's a five person boat. Um, so if you, if you have a bigger family and, you know, you're looking to experience the river, but not necessarily fish, we definitely have accommodations for that as well. Um, be able to float down and experience the river. And there's a couple different packages. It's, it could be as short as an hour and a half float, or you can do a full day, um, where you, you have a packed lunch and you get to see 14 to 20 miles of the river. Okay. We do the top to bottom. I think it's. I think it's close to 20 miles if they go from the bridge all the way down to ski lac okay. lake which a full day float on one of the rafts we would do okay. that the fishing yep. is a little bit different um we kind of pick and choose our sections we don't necessarily see as much of the river as you would see in the raft because we're focusing more on fishing than the scenery whereas when you're in the raft the the guide's just rowing the whole time they're not stopping to fish anywhere. And the only time they're stopping is if you need a bathroom break or maybe there's a beach that, you know, people want to get out and enjoy for a little bit. But for the most part, they're just pushing straight down the river and they got that seven and a half, eight mile an hour current mm-hmm. to help them. So they get to they get to see more of the river. And if, if you're looking for an experience where you get to see as much water as possible and have a little bit more of an opportunity to see wildlife, in my opinion, just because you're seeing more of the Lip River mm-hmm. itself. Like the raft is probably the way to go. Yeah, or maybe you want a shorter day, you know. I mean, our our fishing trips are, you know, half days, four hours, full days, eight hours. Maybe you only have an hour and a half that you want to spend or two hours. Or maybe you don't want to sit in a boat mm-hmm. that long. The raft, you know, the guided raft tour is a great way to just see that whole river in one quick, okay. you know, shot in an hour and a half, two hours. Okay, yeah. really cool. Well, it's good to know that that's an option as well. <laughs> Cause I'm sure that's, that fits some folks schedule a lot better, right. Than, than carving out a half a whole day. Cool. Uh, so if you've, if you've made the trip to Cooper landing, are there other experiences there that you guys would recommend just knowing you spend a lot of time there? Like, do you have a, a plug for other places in Cooper landing that you're like, Oh, if you're here, you've got to take the time to do this. There's lots of hiking. Yeah, a lot, lots of hiking. Um, the Russian River is really popular. That flows into the Kenai just south of Cooper Landing. Um, and the Russian River gets a huge run of salmon. There's bears there. You can watch the salmon jump the waterfall. It's a little bit of a hike to get up to the Russian River Falls. I think it's, what is it, Eric? a couple miles? Two, two miles. Mm-hmm. Two miles, and it's up and down, and it's it, it's a nice yeah. path. So, you know, yeah. not bushwhacking through the middle of nowhere by any means, but it's it's definitely a hike to get up there um but it's it's well worth it if, if i've done it i've done it a handful of times and i'm with you guys like at the right time of year if you're going through there and you don't stop you're making a mistake because you can literally look down right. in that pool but uh below the below the falls there and it's just red with fish right these sockeye yeah. are just you can't even see the bottom. It's just little red, just weaving in and out. It's it's like when you first look at it, you you're almost taken aback. Like, is this real? 
There's so right. many fish in right. there. And then yeah. one will just skyrocket <laughs> yeah. out of the water and try and jump the falls. And yeah. then another one, you know, and you just sit there and watch these salmon try and jump the falls. Some of them get denied. Yep. Some of them make it, you know, you're cheering <laughs> exactly. them on. It's kind of cool. Exactly. And then once in a while, a bear wanders in. You know what I mean? Like the bear yeah. are there. There's decent amount yeah. of bears. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely on the They're, Russian. Yeah, no doubt. Yep. Uh, restaurant wise, I mean, in town in Cooper Landing, we got mm-hmm. Gwyn's. Um, that's pretty fun place. And then the brewery, I yeah. like the brewery. Um, Cooper Landing Brewery's got some yeah. good food. Yep. And if you want to grab cold beer, that's a great yeah. spot. Yeah. There's not, I mean, there's, there's biking trails, hiking trails. It's kind of biking, hiking, fishing, and experience in the river. Uh, Cooper Landing's fairly yeah. small. So there's no grocery store at the time, at this time. Um, you can get fuel in the summer. Uh, even the gas station, one of the gas stations closes down all winter long. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it, it's kind of just a little fishing town. So uh, there are other things to do, but it's, it's definitely based all around the river and kind of being outside. Uh, you're not going to be watching any movies or yeah. anything at the multiplex. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> That's right. very true. I would say, I would say the whole peninsula though has got a lot to offer. I mean, driving down to Homer, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. drive. Um, Soldatna is a great city to get, you know, groceries, place mm-hmm. to stay, a little bit more accommodations. Um, feel a little bit more like you're in, you know, an actual mm-hmm. town, maybe. Um, Cooper Landing special though. It, it hasn't changed much. You know, it, it, it's, it's really small town vibe and, um, I think that's that's kind of the draw yeah, to it, yeah. right? I, I I love it. Like, um, you know, I'm someone who's going through it, you know, usually because I'm going to Anchorage to get materials or, you know, stocking up on groceries. Like, let's go to Costco, you know, those sorts of things. But that said, right. I stop in Cooper Landing quite often, you know, and just to take it in, you know, and I'll do a little walk or go down mm-hmm. by the river and just kind of watch it for a bit. and Or I'll see a moose and, hey, I'll take the 10 minutes and, you know, just kind of take it in. So it's... It is just a beautiful place. Right. Great vibe. It's yep. perfect, perfect halfway point if you are going to home right. too. You know, it's about two hours, two hours and ten minutes from Anchorage, somewhere in that, depending on what's going on with the roads. Traffic. But yeah, um, but yeah, it's like it, it is a absolutely perfect halfway point if you're not trying to do a full four and a half hour right. drive from the airport down to Homer. If you want to break it up a little bit, it's it's the spot to do it um for sure well you guys have been like excellent ambassadors for cooper landing so thank you for that and uh, thanks for joining me today um you guys provided the listeners a ton of information and and uh throughout the podcast uh you know as as people have been watching they've been also seeing pictures and short videos from myself and you guys just to try to highlight that beauty but as you said eric it doesn't do it justice you just got to make the trip and make it happen yeah Yeah, because that's the only way really to experience it and it's it's uh, all its glory. So thanks a lot for that. I, I've frankly got less patience uh, for waiting for the fishing season to start. That's the bummer of having this discussion. We got a little ways to go yet, but dang, I'm, I want to get out there and wet a line. I've been going through some photos and looking back at last season, just trying to get some material for you to have for the yeah. podcast. And you know, we, we worked on a couple of, or I had the opportunity, both of us had the opportunity to work on a couple of videos in the last couple of years. And one of our friends just released that. So hopefully we'll link with that and you guys can see some video footage of what, the, what the river looks like and what we get into out there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Lucas. I, I, I actually went fishing when I got into town yes, right yes. away. I was like, first I did, and I froze my hands and it was, it, the fishing wasn't super great, but I ended up catching one right. fish. So it was, I didn't get I, I I got got my feet wet for the season already, so yeah. But I'm I'm just waiting for the next warm day, and I'm gonna get back out on the river again. Yeah, here. and I'll so. I'll definitely link up your video so listeners can take a look. And I'd encourage folks to watch it. I've watched it a couple of times actually, and uh, it was so well done. You guys did a, just a great job with with the videography and the music that you put to it, and it's just awesome scenery. So thanks for sharing that, and I'll make sure yeah. the the listeners can see that too. Awesome. Well, thanks for the opportunity, man. This has yeah. been fun. 
Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, Lucas. thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we'll be in touch. Uh, I think, you know, down the road, maybe once you get into the season a bit, you know, what I'd like to do is maybe get you guys back on and you can talk a little bit about, hey, here's how the season's going. Here's what we're seeing, you know, the quality of the runs, all that kind of stuff, and, and maybe give our listeners yeah. a little more yeah. real-time insight, you know, this summer. So I'll uh, I'll be in touch. Sounds good. Looking forward all to right. it, Lucas. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah, you. Have, have a good one. Wow, what a uh, what a great and informative uh, episode that was with Eric and Krista Rawls. Uh, can't th- thank those guys enough uh, for taking the time today to uh, sit down and talk uh, drifting down the Kenai River and all the opportunities for fishing and wildlife viewing, et cetera, that it has to offer. So just great. Appreciate that. Um, in our upcoming episode, we're going to be talking to uh, one of the co-founders of Girdwood Brewing. It's a pretty informative episode. If you ever have any interest in checking out Girdwood, um, Alieska Resort, etc., um, this one, this episode offers some pretty good tips, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. So uh, please tune in for that episode. Um, in closing, I would just say one of the funner episodes that uh, I've done. I really enjoyed the time with the guys. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode of uh, Discovering the Last Frontier. Take care.